Welcome to the Radical Rhythm Podcast. This has been created for those of us that love radical women who live perhaps by the rules, but also question and challenge the status quo. We want more from our lives, to enjoy our sexuality, to explore radical thought, and to celebrate women who have lived and continue to live unconventional lives. Hi, I'm Dr. Tony Baer, sexologist, educator, activist, and definitely a radical woman. Thank you for joining me as I share stories of women challenging the status quo and living life to the fullest. Join me as we unapologetically march to the beat of a different drummer together. Well, welcome back, Vi. Thank you so much for agreeing to be on the Radical Rhythm podcast. And um, this is from Evansville, Indiana at the Carter Johnson Leather Library and Collection. So thank you so much for coming uh, once again to talk this time about Lily Harmon, someone I never heard about until I visited your library, and the Kansas Free Love Movement. What is it that turned you on to this topic in the first place, Vi? You ready for a very long story that I'm about to make very, very short? Go ahead. Okay. At a flea market, well, at an estate sale, caught a newspaper in my eye that said, Lucifer the light bearer. Well, the sinner in me thought that somebody was saying something nasty about the church, so I picked up the newspaper. In one corner of the newspaper was an icon of a woman. And in the other corner of the newspaper was something that said freeing women from sexual slavery. You've got my attention. Uh, Now, the newspaper was from about 1881. Bought it, took it home, read it, went, this guy's awfully radical. Ended up finding a few more and realizing how radical the publisher was. A man named Moses Harmon had some really, really strange ideas for his time. Strange like a woman's body was her own. Strange like a woman had the right to keep the property she came into a marriage with. Strange like, oh, a woman had the right to choose her mate, not have him chosen for her by her father, or her brother. Really strange ideas. The more I read, um, the more fascinated I was by the man. Then to find out that Moses Harmon had a daughter who shared all of daddy's ideas. Now, of course, if you're brought up with this, you probably would. Went farther down, as you have often teased me, the rabbit hole to find out that Moses Harmon and his daughter Lillian were not alone. That there were an awful lot of people in Kansas who believed that a woman's body was her own. That both the government and the church needed to keep their noses out of it. Now, let's let's put this in historical context or context. Right. So when we look at this, we're talking Kansas in the Bible Belt. And we're. Pre Bible Belt. They weren't exactly belty a hundred and some odd years ago. Right. We're talking about the mid to late, mostly late 19th century, late 1800s. So the rest of the country is building a transcontinental railroad. The rest of the country is in a reconstruction period coming out of the Civil War. And there are people in Kansas that are for free love. Yep. Yeah, that's why this was an amazing topic to me. And, you know, this podcast is about radical women. And Lily Harmon, in the late 1800s into the early 20th century, is a very radical woman. You betcha. So tell us about her life. Like, what was so radical about her? She shared her father's ideals 
on women not being the property of their husband and that you don't have to legally marry and free love. You choose who you love and you need not be the property of that person. Other than that, what else is radical about her? Okay, now let's let's back this up to young girl growing up in Kansas, learning about all of these ideas that are very, very different from the norm, okay? And meeting an awful lot of other people who shared her father's radical ideas. Now imagine what that would be like, remembering that the age of consent was much, much younger. So we're talking about a woman who could conceivably marry at 14 and be considered a woman, a wife, and a mother at that age. Okay, so you've got a 14, 15, 16-year-old girl who is meeting the intellectuals, the radicals, and what would be considered the anarchists of that time. She fell in love at 16. She fell in love with a man who was almost old enough to be her father, a man named E.C. Walker, who had the same radical ideas she shared with her father. She fell in love, but she is a product of all of these beliefs that a woman's body is her own, which goes against everything. It goes against the Comstock Law. It goes against the marriage acts of both the 1700s and the 1800s all of which dictate how a marriage must happen and all of the parameters around it, from property rights to church rights to what a man can do with his wife, but not what a wife can do with her husband. Coming back to that corner issue, freeing women from sexual slavery. Okay, she's 16. She's in love. She is in love with E.C. Walker, and E.C. Walker is in love with her. But they both share the same ideas. So they go, we believe in free love. Lillian drew up their marriage contract. Wow. This is what I pledge to you. This is what I see as how our lives together will happen. This is what I see and your responsibilities if there is an offspring from this marriage, all of which he agreed to. They pledged their love to each other in a ceremony officiated, and that's probably very badly phrased, by her father, which in and of itself was a violation of the 1857 Marriage Act, because marriage had to be performed by someone who was of the church and approved by the state. So he's in trouble for doing it. They're in trouble for refusing to sign a marriage contract. And basically telling both the church and the state where to get off. A few days later, somebody turned them in. Actually, her stepbrother turned her in. The state comes riding in, or the city actually, arrests both Lillian and E.C. Walker, and she refused to pay the fine. As a result, she sat in jail. No, they broke the Comstock laws? Comstock they broke because they wrote about it. The Comstock law dictates, and it's still kind of applicable today, dictates what can and can't be written about and then sent through the mail. Okay. So in even talking about the marriage ceremony, they were violating the Comstock law once they put it in a letter and sent it out. So that was charged. The bigger one was the um, marriage laws, and there were two of them at that point, that dictated what could happen to get a couple together to make the marriage legal. And by the way, if you cohabitated out of wedlock, you were in violation of the marriage law because you could only have sex after marriage. So this was a protest of the laws as they were, and this is all before women have the right to vote. Oh, yeah. Question, is it a protest or a statement of my own belief? This is what I believe. 
and this is what I'm going to do. Now, if someone else views that as a protest. So she was living her truth. Yeah. It didn't become a protest until the arrest. She was arrested. She refused. Well, they were both arrested. Uh, most of the focus was on Lillian because, you know, a man in prison is one thing, a woman is another. Um, she refused to pay the fine. And she refused to let anyone else pay it for her. So the state against Walker became a major legal case. And it boosted Lillian from Moses Harmon's daughter to this free will, radical, feminist ideal who is standing on her principles and will let no man dictate her life. And they were labeled anarchists. Yeah. And an anarchist is someone who wants to disturb the order of the government and the order of society? Technically, an anarchist is someone who wants to disturb the status quo. And the word has such nasty connotations now because of the last four years of insanity that we don't stop to think about what anarchist really means. An anarchist is someone who is usually standing on something to correct something they feel is unjust. The Freedom Riders were anarchists. The um, suffragettes were anarchists. All of them took a stance to change a law they believed was wrong. And in being willing to stand on their belief, they put the law, unjust, just, whatever, in front of the public consciousness so that win, lose, or draw, it's now an issue for public morals, for the public consciousness to digest, to think about, to take the stance to change. And the only anarchists we really study about in most high schools and colleges um, is Sacco and Venezzi and these uh, European-born socialists who want to change all of the United States labor um, from capitalism to communism and socialism. And, and we're taught in most schools that these are... Um, horrible people. These anarchists are trying to change our economic and governmental system. So when we say anarchist and we say women fighting for their rights, they're almost taught in two different ways. The word, the power of the word, or the fear of the word. Not, not veering too much, but I think you'll follow this. We demonize the word socialist, but this country has socialist cornerstones. The right to an education is a socialist concept. A fire department is a socialist concept. A library is a socialist concept. Socialism meaning for the social good. That's what the word means. An anarchist is someone who wants to change something. Right or wrong, they're trying to create a change. We don't think about Lincoln as an anarchist, and yet he was. The minute he signed the Gettysburg Address, even though technically it never freed a single slave, the minute he signed it, he was an anarchist. He was trying to change something. Which is a beautiful segue into uh, Harmon and other anarchists who were for free love being thrown out of the Socialist Party mm -hmm. in the United States. Hi, you are way too radical for me. Thank you very much. Right. So there's actually like levels of being radical. Mm -hmm. Right. And uh, 
tell me about Victoria Woodhull, because she is probably the best known female in the movement that actually got kicked out of the Socialist Party um, for her ideas on free love. And during that time, from what I read, is free love and the anarchists were actually seeing this as part of their spirituality. Mm -hmm. And uh, tell us about Victoria Woodhull. Well, they were seeing it not just as part of their spirituality, but as part of their, almost their obligation to themselves and to the generations that came after them. Because part of what Woodhull said, part of what the liberation movement of Britain said, all talked about not only them, but their obligations to the future. Because it also included trying to create laws, which is one of the things that Woodhull was, found, was rooted in, trying to create laws for the offspring of children born of free marriages. Now, the, you know, all those things that I have back at the house that we've often talked about and how weird they are and connected. Um, as I've been going through some boxes that belong to the Harmon family and how that happened is a whole different story. That's where I'm taking you next, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have found a couple of letters from George Ben Burrow and his wife, Louis, and Victoria Woodhull, who were all involved together in the Ben Burrow's case in Europe. Now, the implication based on the affection of the letter, you know, written affectionately, fondly, give her my love, which is something that is kind of glossed over today that had more meaning. I'm beginning to wonder if at some point in time Lillian and Woodhull weren't lovers. Right. Which, you know, for those of you listening, this is... We're going full circle here, all right? So this program is about Lillian Harmon, who is a radical woman, the daughter of Moses Harmon, um, someone who is a leader of the free love movement in Kansas in the late 19th century, right? You got that part. And Lillian, having many of the ideals of her father, marries a gentleman but not legally marries a gentleman named Walker. They become imprisoned for breaking the Comstock laws. Marriage laws. Marriage laws. And all of this, uh, this whole conversation, uh, for those of you that are tuning in, came about because here I am, if you can see the background, I'm at the Carter Johnson Leather Library and Collection in Indiana. And in hanging out with Vi, the director of the library, she tells me that she has come across over 5,000 letters from Lillian Harmon, of which, maybe like you, my response was, who's Lillian Harmon? And what did she do? Kansas free love movement? 19th century? You're kidding me. And, you know, most of us, when we think about free love, we think about flower children in the 1960s. We think of hippies. We might think of the feminist movement in the 70s or the gay liberation movement from the 70s to the 80s and free love and love in different ways. But this is way back when. And she is definitely a radical woman. Tell me about these letters. You mentioned one that seems affectionate towards Victoria Woodhull. Um, what else did you see in the letters in general? Okay. Now, make, trying to condense a three-hour story to 30 seconds, an eBay purchase of nine, bo eBay, of nine boxes, which were found in a storage locker that some storage war guy bought, and he put them up for auction. He thought they were the letters of Moses and Lillian Harmon. As it turned out, they were predominantly the letters of Lillian's son, but also his mother's letters, uh, some, a few things from his grandfather, Moses, a whole lot of books, um, a full run of Lucifer the Light Bearer, which in and of itself is invaluable. So let's, let's tell them what that is, because that's how I came into this whole story. 
Vi takes me to a room and shows me this newspaper called Lucifer the Lightbearer. And my ignorant self says, so what? Um, please tell our audience, Vi, so what about Lucifer the Lighthouse? What is and this newspaper? I told you to look at the right-hand corner. And the right-hand corner is an icon of a woman, and it says, freeing women from sexual slavery. And then I said, look at the left-hand corner. And it says, bringing knowledge to the world. And then I said, now look at the headline. And by the way, look at the date. So put all of that together and you've got the beginnings of a discussion we're still having 150 years later. Yeah, a movement to end women's sexual slavery around the world. And all of them, all of the anarchists believed that that sexual slavery began with marriage. That a woman went into slavery the minute she said, I do. And for the most part, considering the marriage laws of the time, they were right. She gave up, if you think about it, she gave up all of her rights. She became the property of her husband. She also gave up all of her property. And her property became the property of her husband. There are legendary stories about a woman of some means thinking the dowry, saying, I do. He gets everything. Three days later, he's left her with all of it. And she has no rights whatsoever. The topic of birth control is also talked about. Yeah. And uh, not only birth control, but just women's suffrage and having rights and being able to vote are yeah. all coming out of this area of Kansas in this newspaper in the late 1800s. Yeah. Or 1900s. The rights of 1800s. children. Who are born of women who do not want to marry. I want to have a child. I want to have your child. And by the way, I don't want you. How radical is that today? Think of how radical it must have been 100 to 150 years ago. And by the way, the reason I don't want you is because I want the kid to have my property. Hmm. But that stance could have gotten her put in jail. Not, not him. Not him. Her. Now, at some point in time, depending on the state, and the laws varied from state to state, about the financial responsibility of the father, not the moral responsibility, not the responsibility to the child in terms of being in the child's life to raise him, just so that the woman and the child did not become a financial burden to the state. And that's all they cared about. I, Vi, I'm going to pop all the way up to today. Um, being in a relationship without being married and having children today or having multiple partners and free love today is very controversial. Yes. And Lillian Harmon from, you know, the late 1800s, uh, is an advocate for free love. And by the way, not just here, but also in Europe. She took all of those ideas because she became such a banner for women all over the world. The story was picked up in England and they brought her there to head the free love movement and to champion all of those male and female who believed in the same ideals. The court case became the pattern for cases that we even see today for those who want to push a law to bring its injustice to the public eye. It's being used, it was used, the same methodology for civil rights cases. It's now being used to challenge transgender law. It's been used to bring these laws to public consciousness. And the steps 
are the same. They were established in the state versus Walker. Why do you think Kansas? Have you ever gotten an answer to that? I, I, For those of you that are listening to this from another country or you don't know where Kansas is, it's right in the middle. It's full of farms. It's very mm -hmm. rural. It's never really been the hotbed of intellectual thought from what I thought. Anyhow, uh, I didn't know about uh, Lucifer, the Lighthouse newspaper until recently. And in terms of hotbed of intellectualism, most of the great writers of the day who were willing to take the chance, notice how I said that, were sending either their letters, their discussions, to the Harmon family, or they were asking the Harmon family to talk about what they were writing. So there was an intellectual group there. But why Kansas? My assumption, and you know what they say about assumptions, would be that the prairie mentality of government, stay the heck over there, Mm -hmm. I will do what I will do that is good for me, my family, my farm, and my small community must have been what created it. The We're here. We know what's good for us because we are here. Mm -hmm. Y'all stay the heck over there. Is the only thing I can think of. Probably greater minds than ours or hopefully someone listening to this may be able to tell us why Kansas? Oh, please. Please write your comments below. There's also an email um, at uh, TonyBearEDD at gmail.com. I would love to hear from you. In fact, Vi and I would love, um, if you're interested in this topic and you are a researcher, Yeah. Um, and this is your area of expertise, and you would like to see the letters from Lily Harmon, now, I, I'm going to push this one because mm -hmm. I'm selfish and I can. Uh, there has been a tremendous amount of question about what happened to Lillian in the last 19 years of her life. She went from this radical woman, publisher, um, daughter of the idealist, wife of another idealist, to pretty much disappearing within a year of her father's death in 1909. Um, I'm sitting on about 5,000 letters that were written by her son, her in-laws, by the entire Harmon family. What's in them, I still don't know. But based on the few things I have found, like a letter from George Ben Burroughs, who was the center of the Ben Burroughs case in London going, get me out of here, I can't stand being over here, to uh, references to Woodhull, to um, her, the receipt for her burial, and other letters back and forth between Lillian to her son and Lillian to her daughter, because the son became a lawyer, the daughter became an artist and other letters back and forth. I have no idea of the treasure trove that's in there, but I have a feeling some researcher looking for her life and the lost years may find them in those boxes, and I'd love to know. Well, Vi, my God, thank you so much for being a guest on this program again. Um, I think I've learned so much um, by taking a look at Lillian Harmon's life, her radical life, the Kansas free love movement. And you know what? Sometimes we think we're very radical today. And we look back at folks who um, make us look pretty tame. And um, yeah. in reading that newspaper, I look forward to reading more. If you see the Carter Johnson Leather Library on tour, please stop by and um, ask the GRIO that is um, personing the library at the time about this. And, um, 
And if you know someone who is in the field of research, um, contact Vi, and I'll, I'll put the information below this link. So Vi Johnson, thank you so much. This is the third time you've appeared on the podcast, and I love to, uh, to engage in conversation about history, culture, philosophy, sociology of, of sex with you. And uh, you are indeed a radical woman. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Radical Rhythm podcast today. It has truly been my pleasure to invite guests and talk to you about my passion, the joy in our sexuality, and radical women who march to the beat of a different drum. If you'd like to work with me, Dr. Tony Bear, I have a community where I give seminars every month. I also have a coaching program, both group and individual, and also a course, a self-directed course, because it's all about experiencing the joy life has to offer. I'd love to work with you. Check out my link below, www.tonybearedd.com. In my group, we can work together to transform our lives to experience the joy life has to offer. See you next week, and don't let anyone dim your shine.